we're going to be talking about hydrology, hydraulics, and geomorphology. And all of these are their own either semester courses, entire degrees. And so this is not a textbook. And what I am, my goal is, is that by the end of this, everyone will feel like we've done a little walk and talk through a stream or we've sat on a stream bank and kind of waved our arms a little. The takeaways are that watershed hydrology is just about how water is moving over land into the soil and into our streams and how that varies. Stream hydrology is about how water is going, varies in flow depth, how long, when are we getting those wet weather frequencies, and um, hydraulics is how fast or slow water moves across different parts of the stream corridor. And then my favorite part are the variations and patterns of stream form, and that's geomorphology, which is just a fancy way of saying um, what are our streams looking like. And I wanted to start off this whole talk with this idea of what a watershed is. Someone in watershed asked me the other day, like, at what point do we have a watershed? What size makes a watershed? And I think that's a really important um, idea because we have, you know, the capital WPD watersheds, which are our kind of our boundaries. We can refer to, oh, we've got Decker Lake watershed, Elm, uh, Gilliland, but a watershed can be as small as a, you know, the roof going, uh, runoff off your roof or as big as Onion Creek. So it really depends on scale. And I just think it's a helpful thing for us to be mindful of when we're talking to community or ourselves. Everybody has a different um, kind of word that they like to use for watershed, watershed, basement, catchment, drainage area, sewer shed. So I just wanted to lay that out there. And then similar for channel, you know, I grew up in the bayous of Louisiana. So I had the Mississippi River and things called bayous. And then I worked East Coast and West Coast, and I was always working in streams. Um, and then I moved to Texas. And now all of a sudden, I use this word creek. So I think that Different people have different um, images of what a creek is versus a stream or a river a or a ditch. Um, and so I think that's another good thing for us to be mindful of, even when we're talking amongst ourselves or with the community. We've got Waller Creek, headwaters of Waller Creek here and East Bolden right behind OTC. In yeah. our watershed in Austin, our main water source is rain. So we've got last week's Wednesday rain from... Hydromet, I have OTC here, and then Sherman over here. We've got about an, a little over an inch and a half of rain last Wednesday. And we also have in across Austin, we have some springs, which we know well. Here's some beautiful videos. Even in East Austin, we have springs, shallow alluvial springs, and they look different than we're maybe used to, but might think that they're a pipe a little busted pipe, but all of those sources do eventually get to our creek, so that's another source. So watershed hydrology, water falls or you know, comes out of a spring, and they have fast routing and slow routing. So slow routing sometimes is through springs. This is an example of an, a dye trace, a well going through car systems, and that routing can, I learn, be really fast, like up to four miles a day or a quarter of a mile a day. And then we have, um, it's important to know where everything that the water is flowing through on our watershed and what's picked up gets eventually into our stream. So here we have this famous picture of Starin um, with some really uh, well-fed, nutrient-rich algae. Similar, you can see it with the trash in our creeks, you know, that's being picked up and moved downstream. And for me, the flow routing is sometimes not super obvious because I'm not often walking around in wet weather. Some of our crews definitely are, but the dry weather flows, like this is a picture from Spills where we had a water break and you could see that plume go all the way down to Ladybird and we could easily follow it up. Sometimes slopes are so subtle, even on streets. One thing I love to do now is kind of walking around my neighborhood and guessing where would the water be going along the curbs and then wait for there actually to rain and see if I was right. So here we have kind of this typical roof to gutter to concrete all the way down and then right into Waller. This is about, you know, that's that kind of fast, really connected 
flow. And then we also have areas in town where we might have the we can kind of disconnect that impervious cover. So we have flow and on our small frequent storms, it can kind of flow into this little turfed swale that Tom made. And then when it's too full, it'll bypass. And then similar in the Peace Park restoration, here's an example where we were able to pull back our outfall so that instead of dumping straight into Shoal Creek, we were able to pull back, let them flow through the swale so that the water that was on the road isn't going straight to the creek on these low or smaller, really frequent events, it doesn't even flow straight to the creek. It kind of slowly infiltrates over. And then out uh, in Sherman, FOD looked like they had a lot of fun making these kind of depressions where the flow that what they were intercepting from the site was flowing into these depressions. And on these small frequent events, it settles in right here. And when, then when it gets bigger, it'll go to this next depression. And then there's even a third. So that's another way where we can, these are obviously engineered, but you can get this idea that connectivity matters. Um, so we have our street gutters. I was following some of the flows for our for this talk um, on Wednesday, and I just started following them down, watching it go into the curb. And then once it's in the curb, it's kind of, you know, pretty much going in general to our creek. So we're now we're getting into the stream hydrology piece. And that's important because stream hydrology, this is the same trib, different sides of the street, where our stream hydrology really, it matters how fast the water is getting here, how frequent water is getting here. Before we had impervious cover, you know, we'd have, we would have a storm, a small storm really frequently, and maybe not all of that water would go straight to it. This was in the beginning of the Wednesday flow, and it was not, there wasn't a lot of rain, but on the creek side, it I would have guessed that there had been a lot of rain, so you kind of get those pulses. Similar place, we have an enclosed culvert where the stream is completely enclosed, pretty much the 90-acre drainage, and we have a lot of flow, and this was just the beginning of that storm on Wednesday. The hydrograph is just where we are, depending on where we are, this rate of water flow over time. So we've got our OTC and Sherman for reference. This really depends on what a hydrograph is kind of what the stream is feeling during an event. This was a Wednesday. So kind of close to OTC, we had a pulse and then it went down. Sherm or closer to on Gillen, we had an even larger pulse and then went down. So for the hydrograph, what the stream is experiencing depends on the how high the water is getting so that flow depth and also like how long that lasts so when we're getting these small frequent events sometimes we get a pulse every single time if it's really highly connected and this is just a plug for we can get water alerts to your tech uh, on your phone with text messages and i think those are really fun i'm um, just trying to get a idea of what's going on around town or project sites and frequency is really important in streams. So part of the stream hydrology, again, is how we have a, an event from last Wednesday. We know um, intuitively that it wasn't as large as that kind of more rare Halloween flood back in 2015. So how often are we getting high flows? How often are we getting these low flows? That's all about frequency and will depend on stream hydrology, which depends on watershed hydrology. I love this visual. This is from Boulder Creek after one of the big boulder floods in Colorado. They installed a art piece of art that kind of helped the community visualize frequency and flow depth. So this was um, 50 years this is a sculpture where it shows the 50 years, the 100 years, and the 500 years so that folks can kind of walk the green belt or while it's having a storm and kind of get a gauge of, oh, yeah, this was a lower event compared to what they had um, before. So I think that was a nice way of thinking about flow depth and frequency. Now I'm going to turn it over to Shash. Connectivity refers to the flow, exchange, and pathways that move organisms, energy, and matter throughout the watershed system. Uh, these interactions create complex but in interdependent processes that vary over time. Uh, to understand the connectivity concept, uh, it can be described in four dimensions. Uh, the longitudinal dimensions is the linear connectivity 
that is the connection from headwater to the mouth of the river. And the lateral connectivity is basically the floodplain connectivity with the mainstream, uh, which I'll explain in the next um, slide. And vertical connectivity, which we call it as hyperic connectivity, primarily refers to uh, below the stream bed and groundwater connectivity with mainstream. And of course, the last but not the least is the lateral and I mean temporal connectivity, which is uh, the connectivity over time uh, with many scales like uh, seasonal, multi year, uh, let's say two year, five year, 100 year, that kind of things, that, that connectivity. Uh, this connectivity concept is uh, based on river continuum concept, which is a model for classifying and describing flowing water. Uh, and this is the concept of dynamic equilibrium uh, in which stream functions are in actually balance between physical parameters such as width, depth, velocity, sediment load, and also taking into account some uh, biological factors. Uh, this is a holistic concept and was developed in early 1980s. Uh, I'd like to go a little more detail on lateral connectivity, uh, which is basically the stream floodplain connectivity, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, lateral connectivity allows the stream access to its floodplain during high water events. Uh, this access is critical for the healthy ecosystem function by exchanging uh, nutrients and other organic matter to and from the stream. Uh, there are many benefits of this connectivity, uh, such as flood storage, cleaning of uh, water, uh, groundwater recharge, uh, increase in riparian forest, uh, which is very important for the habitat, and much more actually. Uh, let's let's go a little deep into uh, stream and environmental hydraulics. Uh, when we go to the stream and see what 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 we can see is basically the pool and refill, and we see the hydraulic jump. And uh, if the creek is muddy, we see the sediment. Pool refill occurrences occurrences like depend on the geometry of the channel, uh, basically the slope of the channel and the velocity of the flow. Uh, in any natural stream, uh, there is a sequence of pool and refill, which is really important for the stream's overall health. When the stream water flows from a steep slope to a very mild slope, uh, at the bottom of the steep slope, there is a swirling of water and it's called the hydraulic jump. Pool refill and hydraulic jump type of phenomena are important for maintaining the dissolved oxygen level in the stream. Uh, there are a lot of things and processes happening under the surface, which of course we cannot see. These are in-stream biogeochemical processes. We can guess, but we don't know what, what's the velocity of the stream and what's the stream power. These are very important parameters to estimate the erosion potential of the stream. Let's, let's go more detail on uh, stream and flood plain hydraulics. We call the stream flow is open channel flow. This flow is divided into steady and unsteady flow. If the flow at a, at a certain section is constant over time, it is called a steady flow. Otherwise, it's unsteady flow. Uh, in steady flow, if the velocity is not changing at different sections of the stream, uh, it is called the uniform flow. Otherwise, it's, it's varied flow. Uh, in, in, in both of these categories, depending on how it is changing, they are divided into gradually varied and rapidly varied flow. Uh, roughly speaking, if we consider uh, base flow of a stream, it is steady uniform flow. Uh, in a storm event, when there is first increase in the flow and then decrease, it is primarily the unsteady flow. The main objective of stream and flood plane hydraulics is uh, to find out the velocity of the flow in the stream and flood plain. Uh, for this Manning's equation on the, on the picture here on the left uh, is used. This equation was developed in actually 1889, about 130 plus years ago, but we, we are still using this for modeling. 
as you see here, the velocity depends on geometry of the channel, slope of the channel, and basically the roughness of the channel. If the roughness is high, just like in the lower left picture, like with the grass lining, velocity decreases. And if the roughness is low, like in the concrete channel, engineered channel, velocity increases. Uh, but this is this looks obvious uh, to to all of us. This equation used to quantify this velocity. All we uh, do in plot plane modeling is to find out what is the frequency of the storm, which basically comes from the storm event for rainfall, and how high water goes in the stream in the flood plane, and how wide it, it is spreads in the flood plane, and how fast it moves. Th these poor things, basically. As I mentioned in in the I think in the previous slides how important flood plane is to keep the stream and uh, watershed healthy. Through our regulations, such as drainage and environmental criteria manuals and land development course, we make sure that there is no rise in water surface elevation, there is no increase in flood plane width, and there is no increase in velocity of flow. Uh, that actually, that may cause adversely to the upstream, downstream, and side neighbors. This groundwater surface water exchange is the vertical connectivity that I explained in my first slide. There is a continuous exchange of surface water and groundwater from and to the stream. Along with the water, there is an exchange of nutrients as well. The exchange rate and the direction of the exchange, the give and take, follows the, similar, the same principle of energy flow uh, from high energy to low energy. In hydraulic terms, it is called the hydraulic grade line. In the stream, it is the top of the water surface, and in the groundwater, it is called water table. Water table is basically the boundary of saturated and unsaturated ground. During peak flow time after the storm event, as you see from the second figure from in the, in the left, the flow of water is away from the stream. As flow receives in the stream, the flow is directed to the stream and ultimately maintains the base flow condition in the stream. Then the cycle repairs with this exchange as stream flow increases after rain events. Uh, don't you see this is a pump in and pump out just like our heart? I think it is. This, ex this inhale, exhale uh, type of um, phenomena is important for stream connectivity and overall stream health. Uh, now I give back to Lindsay. I love the analogy of the inhale exhale on on that taking kind of carrying through with this stream or river corridor concept where we have this is a cross section of a creek that Chef Shesh was showing. We might we do a lot of modeling and a lot of regulations and thinking about the hundred year event and those really big or you know more than a hundred year event also that's really what can shape our kind of larger scale valleys or our terraces. The smaller events are actually what shape the primary flow path that we see during our, um, you know, our less than two year flow. Some people call it bank full. And it's these especially low events that are in the kind of the middle of the channel or faster part of the channel that are really ecologically and geomorphically important. I have been really loving this image in terms of geomorphology and stream corridors that came out of Watershed's Waterloo project. It's a kind of 3D cross you know, profile cross sections that help look at breaking down different features that we might see in streams. So here's an example of a riffle. We have some scour pools. And you can imagine that in these smaller events, as the flows are going up and the flows are going down frequently, we start to engage different features. So for example, when we have our smaller frequent events, maybe we are having flows through the riffles. If we are starting to raise it even beyond then, we might be starting to get flows covering the gravel bars that we're seeing. And as we 
have higher depths, we might be starting to get into these um, kind of low bank height or a little bit of floodplain interactions. And I just you know, shout out to the Waterloo team. I have been really enjoying that. Going from stream hydrology into geomorphology, geomorphology and how the stream looks to us is really this trinity of sediment, topography, and flow or hydraulics. And for me, I think a lot about when we go to a site kind of reading the creek, we can look at different indicators and we can generally see what is the balance between our resistant forces and our erosive forces in terms of if we're having, you know, I'm kind of focusing here um, on when we go to a site and we're having some kind of instability issues, because that's often what we're trying to repair. Our eros erosive forces have to do with discharge, slope, it's that velocity driving um, that can pick up sediment. And depending on how the stream beds and banks are, that's that resistance force. So we can have unstable conditions where we have really high discharge now, whether it's from now we have a lot more impervious cover that's go that originally wasn't in our stream. So the stream, the natural stream beds that we have can't resist that. Um, and then we can also have areas that are unstable where we are having the same amount of discharge, but now we're having so much sediment that maybe came from upstream that that sediment is getting deposited and the discharge um, isn't able to keep carrying it. We are trying to create a lot of balances from resistance and erosion as part of our work. Sometimes we add resistance. This is a great picture of Eric Lauks at Sherman with some mega 36 inch um, Rip wrap that we might add to some places that we really don't want to have the stream bed change, and then we also have a you know a ton of SEMs out there. We have detention ponds, detention pond inspections are critical because we are expecting these ponds to hold back water. We have um, even smaller scale options where we have. This is an example that Tom did. Um, on 18th and Grand and Rio Grande, where the flows on our small events are actually captured and kind of stay in this turf swale, and on the bigger ones that keep they are routed into the streams. We also have again the Sherman, um, where Sherman started flowing, catching some of that flow and not having it go into Carson Creek. This is some examples of localized issues that we have. This is here's a picture of Ingrid and Boggy trip where we've get, got some scour going on, some bank failures is looking down, down, watching bank failure of some sloughing off. Here are just our more examples, kind of our, of our, some of our problems. We have incision when we have too much discharge and not enough um, bank resistance, a he classic head cut. A lot of our responses are fairly acute. They happen fairly quickly. And it, if we're going to let it kind of equilibrium become stable, it can take thousands of years. So what we're going in often at, to do is to catalyze that, either changing the hydrology or often kind of stabilizing and helping that recovery. This is another example where just in a few months, just to show how fast this can change, this is in a few months we were watching this head cut um, go through this old grade control in Country Club West. And this is a great video, I feel like, that just shows what's happening when we have these um, stabilizing features that we lose and why we have instability going upstream. This is another issue where even when we had a forest in Gilliland, there was a head cut that started downstream and within just a few months, the tree roots weren't strong enough to resist that head cut migrating through. The only thing that's stopping that head cut right now is this road is providing a grade control. Here's an example out in Catalina where we um, put in a grade control to try to stop that head cut that was starting to go through. And as you know, this is really impressive and we're able to engineer this, but we can't do this at every head cut. So it's important that we can try to think about what serves as head cuts around Austin. We've got our bed bedrock outcrops out west. We have sometimes uh, log jams. Every time I go to a creek and I see a grade control that 
is working, I feel really uh, grateful. It can sometimes be as small as cobble riffles, depending on the stream dynamics. Stream beds erode, and sometimes we can call it erosion, scour, sometimes we have bank failure, eventually it's deposited. We want to know how long is it eroding, some, how or geomorphology is really impacted by how long erosion is happening, how much erosion is happening, how often erosion is happening. We have, here's a picture of Jeff, we're trying to, you know, we have a project right now doing erosion monitoring to kind of target and dial in how different erosion, that initiation of erosion and how frequent that happens across town. So we're, we're looking at that now. And even though I'm very erosion focused, it is important to remember that the sediment that is eroded doesn't just disappear, right? We're not, we're st it still exists. And so where does the sediment go? It's the really small sediment is suspended to fines. You might, when you're in a creek, you might notice that it's turbid or cloudy. It's what's suspended in the water. And that'll keep going downstream until the water is slow enough to let it settle out. And then we have coarser sediment, which includes sands, pebbles, cobbles. You'll see those in kind of like gravel deposits. This is a great example of reading the creek where if you go out, you can see that in this space, the flow was too slow. And so it dropped out the sands and pebbles. But here it was too fast, so it kept carrying the sands and pebbles. So all you have right there are the coarser sediment. Most obvious place of where we're getting, you know, where does the sediment go? This is Waller Tunnel. We get we have tons of sediment that we have to remove. And we don't know where all of this sediment is even coming from in Waller, but we are managing it and having to clean it out. So this is a reminder that even if we have an erosion at some place, it has to the sediment is going somewhere. And so that's important for us to remember. We have some streams that are looking pretty good. We've got uh, kind of an overall balance where we win some, we lose some, we pass some. I'm talking about sediment here. This is uh, one spot behind OTC that in general, we have some access to the floodplain. So you can kind of see, depending on what event, the creek is moving around a little bit, not a ton of erosion, not a ton of deposit. And overall, it's pretty balanced. I would argue that even this is pretty balanced. This is a bedrock creek and we're just passing all of it through because it's so smooth. We have a lot of hydrology, but it's not super unstable in this particular section. Is it good for our ecology? No. Did it used to have sediment here? Yes. But right now um, it's still, it's at a balance in terms of just sediment transport in that it's passing it all through. And this is an image that I love from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources showing gravel. We've got these little shiners, some small math bass. I'm showing this because how often sediment moves is critical for a lot of our stream ecology. So how often those gravels are picked up immobilized that's just saying how often is it eroding right so when we have these small events that are super connected and then we're having these outfalls coming into our streams and we're getting these really big pulses even with small events that's different on an ecological timeline than what our macro invertebrates have been involved to um, withstand so if we're moving these gravels quickly then that's changing um, how our ecosystem functions. Here's a great picture of a caddisfly with some of gravels in its shell. So thinking about that, and I know that we'll link that and talk about that more as we go up the functional pyramid. This is also from my water, Waller, or yeah, Waterloo, Waller Creek love. They took those different components of the stream feature and they were able to connect it to both geomorphology, so kind of resistance, and then also our aquatic ecology. And I just really like how clearly that was connected. I often think about erosive and resistance forces um, when I'm thinking about how are we mitigating something. So trying to go through probably a, I'm a linear thinker to a fault. So I have to really break it down into processes. Like, are we increasing resistance? Are we reducing velocities? Are we doing both? What can we do where? This is an image out of in Blackland Prairie where we've had, you know, almost 150 years of riparian forest loss. We don't have that 
bank stabilization anymore. We don't have that stream bed resistance that we would get from tree roots. And we also don't have as much watershed, kind of the watershed upland capturing the flow. So we're having a lot of problems out there. Thank you for joining us on a stream talk and walk. I hope y'all learned something. And I open it up for questions and would especially like to hear from folks who maybe don't think about geomorphology as often. Todd made a comment yesterday about caddisflies and resistance. Do, do you remember what his comment was? Um, maybe Mateo can remember since he, he knows more about caddisflies than I do. Do you remember Res Mateo? Like stream bed resistance? Well, yeah. <laughs> It, what the the comment was how ecology can play even a, a more kind of physically functional role in stream systems than people really realize that a lot of uh, the net spinning caddisflies, um, we have a few here in Austin, um, they actually can get so dense and make such uh, like a, a, an array of nets that they can move that kind of boundary layer of, of velocities up above the the, the mm substrate and actually change the way water flows through these streams you know it's on a smaller scale than maybe beaver or some of the other engineers that we have but they definitely affect the stability um, of some of the kind of substrates and, and riffles uh, systems that we have in certain streams yeah for like those uh those west side streams that are really flat and really wide and maybe only be a half an inch deep maybe an inch deep but you're still pushing through maybe you know five or six cubic feet per second just because mm. the stream's so wide and flat mm -hmm. when you have a bunch of these little they look like little tents and they're all facing upstream and they all catch water and so they cause water then stop and bump and go over them so um tiny itty bitty beavers yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you i actually have a question uh, on that those ideas of you know how biology feed but feed, feeds back into providing resistance you mentioned that um, in, in that Blackland Prairie Creek where the trees were no longer able to sufficiently provide that resistance. Can you speak a little bit more on, on the role that uh, biological elements such as trees uh, are an important component depending on what ecoregion we have in our, in our area? I was really surprised. Um, I've been working on Blackland Prairie geomorphology and vegetation over the past couple of years, recently put out a um, report about it. But to be honest, I have always thought of stream banks being affected by trees um, and having that strength you can imagine, like cypress roots along the edge or you know any kind of stream roots. But I found that in Blackland Prairie, and I've started seeing this kind of across Austin, even in, in um, the West, we have a lot on the narrower, the narrower streams. We have stream routes going through. And in the Blackland Prairie, we don't have a lot of, we don't have bedrock outcrops because we're in a different ecoregion. All that limestone that we see out West is there, but it's way down. So we have these, this huge lens of alluvial and um, kind of clay that we can start cutting into the stream. So naturally the only hard point, hard points that used to exist in the Black Loom Prairie were our riparian forests, which spoiler alert, um, I have been able to find a ton of historic writings on what did the Blackland Prairie Creeks look like, and the and the most of them are from like the early settlers, and they all describe something different than what I am used to thinking, which I used to think, oh, prairie doesn't involve trees, um, but we have a ton of records where the Blackland Prairie was covered in these ribbons of trees and riparian forests and we have early settlers even describing water flowing through there as clear which is just like to me it was a total shift um, and then once I thought about the processes it really makes sense prairies used to be um, you know really the grassland part would be a soaking in so you're taking that um, kind of erosive force piece of it and then the riparian forest that used to be there would have been both resistant on the bank and resistant across. So even though the particles are much finer than what we would see in West Austin, we had that balance, both on the watershed scale and on the resistance of um, the Blackland Prairie. 
thank you everybody for, for attending and stay tuned. There will be more presentations coming in.